all sorts of reasons people don't seek medical care. Some face financial hardship. Others simply don't make the time. But in certain ethnic communities, language barriers and deep-rooted cultural perceptions combine to make obstacles to treatment even more formidable. In tonight's Focus Report, we look at the stigma surrounding mental illness in the Latino community and what's being done to improve access to care. It's Thursday, and Jose Acevedo arrives for his regular appointment with his therapist. Now in recovery, he's struggled for years with substance abuse, anxiety, and depression. My symptoms were sleeping too much or not at all, eating too much or not at all. And I was anxious. I couldn't relax. And at night, all these problems kept running through my mind, and I couldn't fall asleep. Jose refused to get help and hit rock bottom. His substance abuse got out of control. He lost his family and landed in prison. When I had these symptoms, I didn't tell anyone and kept them to myself. I was afraid people would judge me and avoid me. The fear to seek help is something Luisa Pimentel sees all too often among her Latino patients at Casa Esperanza, a mental health clinic in Dorchester. Particularly here with the Latino population, mental health services and therapy aren't things that they're used to and that are common. So when they come here to seek help, they're kind of embarrassed. They don't tell their families because their families, they're scared their families will view them as broken. But cultural barriers are only part of the problem in communities where English is a second language. The language is huge. Even if a client knows English um, and they grew up speaking Spanish, um, they have an easier time explaining their emotions in their native language. It, like, they'll speak English in here, but once it gets really deep or really emotional, the Spanish just comes out. Created in 1984, Casa Esperanza remains one of the few treatment centers in Massachusetts to offer full bilingual services. For Jose, a native of Puerto Rico who speaks little English, that was key. Having a person who understands me culturally, who speaks my language, has helped me a lot because I can express myself. That cultural understanding is exactly what Dr. Mari Carmen Benesar teaches at the Newton Bay School of Professional Psychology. Learning about a culture, learning about and addressing oppression, Remember that? And then the third one is an ongoing process of addressing your biases and stereotypes. With a growing ethnic population in Massachusetts, Dr. Benesar says the next generation of therapists must not only speak other languages, but understand those cultures, too. It's beyond the language. Uh, we do focus on uh, taking someone uh, uh, that has uh, basic and intermediate uh, skills for language beyond and more advanced, uh, but that cultural understanding that would allow that person to make a connection in therapy. Some of Dr. Benassar's graduates now work at Casa Esperanza, which provides services to over 150 people, mostly in Spanish. As for Jose, he credits them with bringing stability to his life. Getting professional help here at Casa Esperanza has changed my life because I've learned that my world hasn't ended, that there is a future for me. My next guest believes understanding cultural attitudes is a crucial part of the mental health treatment. Dr. Nicholas Covino is president of the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. Welcome to Greater Boston. Thank you very much. So mental health is still a stigma in, in, in a lot of cultures, including just every, every day. <laughs> it's, you know, people avoid putting it on their uh, insurance forms. They'll pay for it themselves. But why is it more difficult in the Hispanic community? Well... Uh, certain cultures have different meanings associated with seeking help. And so mm. there are cultures that say, really important for me to bear something on my own. Uh, really important for me to avoid having any discussion about weakness of any uh, sort. Um, I'd argue, though, as the, uh, the clip suggests, one of the big problems we have is we don't have people that look like yeah. people when they come and they want mental health care and they meet an Anglo provider, half of the time folks from the Latino community don't come back because there's something we miss, something of importance that we miss. People want to talk about mental health issues in, in the language of their birth. People want to talk sure. about culturally important things with people that understand their culture. Uh, we have less than 2% of mental health providers in this country that are language and, and culturally competent. Is it a macho thing, too, in, in that community? Or are there more women likely to seek help? Yeah, I think that would be a caricature to say it that way. I think really the issue is, like in 
any business, you'd like to meet somebody that understands mm. your business, whether you are working in the media or whether you're working in education. Uh, in therapy, it's really important to establish an alliance with somebody first. You can't do our work unless people feel comfortable and able mm. to uh, feel safe and understood. Uh, a knowledge of somebody's culture is really very basic. All right, let's bring Stephanie Hartwell into the conversation. She's a sociology professor at UMass Boston who specializes in mental health issues. Well, Stephanie, as we heard Jose Acevedo say, he had substance abuse mm -hmm. problems, and that really led him down this path. How do you separate the two? Are, are, are there some people who come to seek professional help who don't have abuse problems, but they might have a form of schizophrenia or just a, you know, a manic depression or bipolar, has nothing to do with drugs, and does it matter? Is the end result the same? It does matter. In having a comorbidity, having a substance abuse and a mental health issue, you have to sort of tease those things out and match the appropriate therapy, dual recovery therapy, something that's going to address both. Because certainly it's a bifurcated, cyclical issue when you're having a mental illness and you're on substances mm. and you're leaving the substances and then addressing the mental health need. It is cyclical and you need to know if folks are duly diagnosed so that you can also treat the substance abuse issue. Folks that are have just a mental health issue in minority communities. We do know that if you control for income, if you control for insurance, that minorities are less likely to access mental health care and support, although they might have a greater need because there's institutional historical racism, there's issues with immigration, migration, cultural issues, as the clip pointed out. So we have to sort of tease mm -hmm. all these things out, and certainly substance abuse is quite common in coupling with mental health issues. Okay, so a big of the focus has been so far on, on the culture of this. When somebody comes into your practices, do you try to pair people with, with cultural similarities so that they're comfortable talking? So again, we've got less than 2% of mental health professionals yeah. who can deliver the care. So Casa Esperanza is a very unique uh, organization that mm -hmm. draws people into a community that needs mental health care like that. Uh, a program like ours that you saw Dr. Benassar mm -hmm. uh, running at uh, MSPB is designed to, to be a magnet to recruit people from the Hispanic community who have the ability to go and meet people with the language and cultural understanding when they graduate from a school like MSPB. But it's quite unusual to be able to culturally match like that. When people do that, there are studies in uh, the Asian community that say people stay longer in treatment if they find somebody that just looks like them mm. when they come, come for care. Uh, so it's really critical that we make a paradigm shift in the way that we do business in, in, mm -hmm. in mental health care. Uh, it, it, it also, I'd argue, is true that we should make that shift for all mental mm -hmm. health care. Kinds of things that you see in the media promote a stigma that is really hard to oppose. Something like six, seven, eight out of ten of the people that you see on television that are portrayed as people with mental illness look like violent people, yeah, even though true. there's no literature to suggest that those people with mental illness have a propensity towards mm. violence any more than anybody else does. So the Caribbean factor being poverty as well. I mean, right, yeah. socioeconomic poor, status. You worry, I mean, presumably, mm -hmm. you're, you're worried. Mm -hmm. You're worried about your finances, you're worried about your family, you're worried. So it can be a grind. I think uh, Jose explained it very well. You know, just like you can't sleep at night because you're just grinding over and over. What do you do for those people? Because you're not, you're not putting them on drugs to make those symptoms disappear. What do you do? Well, you do have to provide the services. And I think that thinking about you know training the providers to at least be culturally competent into understanding these things, understanding socioeconomic status. The other thing you have to think, be very flexible in how you offer care. Is care accessible for these populations? One of the things that I sort of joke about, you know, who has time to, <laughs> to, to go to these mental health appointments? If you're working day to day yeah. for a paycheck, you've got to make that care either out on the road, home visits, clinics that are available in alternative hours, and also clinics that do the outreach to bring the people yeah. in that have that cultural competency. Because right now we are behind in educating providers that have the diversity that we need mm. to address the multiple populations with multiple needs from multiple cultures. And in making that match, you know, part of our job in being in universities is educating people to, to do that in the future, but until that time, you've got to be incredibly flexible and offer the services that the people want and that they, they, that where they can access them. And access is a huge structural piece. So you have the individual and their issues and what their issues are with their social network and their family. You've got the provider piece, but then you've got to address the social structural pieces such as accessibility as well.
And until we have more folks who can speak a language, people of color mm -hmm. in our profession, Anglo providers have to be culturally competent to be able to deliver the care that people need. All right. Thank you both for coming. Appreciate Thank so you. much your input. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.